Did I ever tell you about my adventure in the jungles of the Yucatan Peninsula? No? <laughs> well, let's see now. It was back in 19... 2019, just last month, Cassie Thompson and I decided to investigate the Maya ruins to see if we can learn something more about this fascinating ancient civilization. We made our way through jungles, mountains, rivers and streams, dirt roads, rocky paths, tourists, to see what we had to see. Would you like to hear about it? Well, sit down anyway, and let me relate to you the details of this epic journey. Welcome to the Antiquities Travel Guide. Follow us to different countries as we search for ancient artifacts. If you too wish to explore the ancient past through travel, we'll help you plan where to go, what to see, and how best to enjoy what you encounter. In this series of the ATG, you can accompany Cassie and me on our trek through the Yucatan Peninsula, homeland of the ancient Maya. Come on, let's go! In the Yucatan Peninsula, there are Mayan ruins galore. Maya culture of the Yucatan, for the most part, had its heyday, or what the archaeologists call its principal fluorescence, during the Late Classic and Terminal Classic periods, between about 600 and 925 CE. This was the time that monumental architecture and art in the region reached its peak, and its population reached about 200,000 people. In regard to most parts of the world, I count ancient history as ending around 600 CE or so, but in Mesoamerica, the dividing line is better placed at the end of the Terminal Classic, so as an ancientist, I feel comfortable providing historical coverage up until then. Anything after that, post-classic and so forth, I'm not going to be concentrating on. We flew into the city of Merida, Mexico, on the tip of the peninsula. Merida is less well known than Cancun, but it's a decent sized city with a lot to do. We got in late, so we immediately went to our hotel. We stayed in the old part of town, which also is the most interesting. Our accommodations were at the Gran Hotel de Merida a historic building in the center of all the action. We strolled around town, taking in the sights and sounds. And we found a great little place to eat called La Chaya Maya, which specializes in Yucatec Mayan cuisine. Oh, I couldn't wait. We were wondering about how the food in Mexico might affect us on the first night, but we had no trouble at all. We just avoided the water, just in case. Our meals were delicious. Cassie is a vegetarian, and the menu offered her options. In the morning, we picked up our car from Hertz, right next to the airport. In order to embark on our journey, we decided on a rental. But we made sure to get a vehicle with four-wheel drive, even though it was the dry season, because we knew part of our trek around the peninsula would take us off the beaten path. Fortunately, this day, our drive was all on paved roads. First stop, the site of the ancient city of Uxmal. Gringos like us have been known to say Uxmal, but please keep in mind that in Mayan, an X is pronounced like SH. Cost to get in is 413 pesos, which is about 21 US dollars, not including parking. We've classified all of our archaeological sites and museums into categories. A category one means it's one of the bigger ones. When I say bigger, I mean it has more to see. Maybe it's larger, it has more artifacts, or it could just have really large artifacts, but it's the top tier. Middle tier is category two. That means it's a medium-sized site or medium-sized museum. And then category three would be a minor site with some interesting things to see, but it's not one of the biggies. So now you'll know what I'm talking about when I start using these categories. We finally made it.
Uxmal is a UNESCO heritage site and is the best preserved of all Maya ruins. Uxmal, although it was first settled in the 6th century, perhaps a little earlier, flourished during the Terminal Classic period. It was one of the greatest Mayan cities ever built. At its peak, its population reached roughly 20,000 people. Uxmal is one of three major archaeological sites in the Mayan region, uh, the others being uh, Kalukmo and Chichen Itza. Because of the size and scale, we classify it as a category one, and it covers about 150 acres. It was the seat of the Shu family, but we believe they were not the original builders and came to power after Uxmal was already in existence. Nevertheless, they ruled when Uxmal was at the height of its power. The structure known as the House of the Governors or Governor's Palace is a real eye catcher. It stands on a raised platform. The lower sections of the building are plain, they have rounded corners, uh, they have small entrances, but the upper sections are highly decorated. The mosaic that wraps around the building features serpents, pillars, masks, lattice work, and is 320 feet long. We are here at the Governor's Palace at Uxmal. And although it was one of the last buildings to be constructed here, I wanted to show it to you first because it well demonstrates the Pu'uk style of architecture. During the Terminal Classic period, the Pu'uk style was the dominant form. And it's named for the region of the Yucatan that we're now in. And Uxmal is the largest Pu'uk site that we've got. The Pu'uk style of architecture is characterized by very thin squares of limestone veneer over the cement and rubble core. Boot-shaped vault stones, decorated cornices, round columns and doorways, half columns repeated in long rows, and heavy use of stone mosaics on upper facades, which have crisscrossed lattice designs and masks with long hook-shaped snouts. Notice the distinct layering of the stonework. Do you see these uh, masks going all the way around the palace? Those masks are each representing an iconographic mountain and together they make a flower mountain motif. They've got flower headdresses that they're wearing. The flower mountain in Mayan mythology is an animate mountain. Uh, this is shown in very stylized fashion, but we're gonna see more examples of the flower mountain motif as we go along. So what is the flower mountain exactly? Well, there are various interpretations. Uh, some say it is the uh, mountain at the center of the world where the tree of life grows. Some say it's the mountain where uh, the ancestors dwell in a paradise. Some say it's where the gods or humans ascend to heaven. Some say it's the mountain where maize originated. Some equate it with the Aztec cave of emergence, which is a later myth, but we believe it maybe could have started earlier. And some say it's where the uh, humans and gods ascend to heaven. What is that? What's what? That figure with the long plumed headdress. Oh, that! Yes, that is Chak. He's the god of water, lightning, and rain. What's interesting about Chak is that you'd think he was a sky god because he's related to the storms, but no, he's related to the earth. Because around here, there are quite a few cenotes. These are water sinkholes, which is where uh, you'll see chalk fishing sometimes, but it's where the Mayans got their water. So they often think of him as being associated with these sinkholes rather than with the sky. You see here, he's got a reptilian snout. Uh, he's sometimes portrayed as having uh, cat whiskers as well. So he's kind of an unusual looking god. Here's the terrace in front of the governor's palace, which has been dubbed the Platform of the Jaguars. It's named for this sculpture of two jags connected by the throat. We think it was once a ceremonial altar of some kind. Interestingly, there was a sakbe, that's a causeway, a white road, that stretched from this platform to the city of Kaaba a few miles away. We'll be going there later. It suggests that these two cities were connected ceremonially. Right next to the governor's palace on the same raised platform is the building commonly called the House of Turtles. Why? Because it has a frieze of turtles carved around its cornice. The Maya believed that during times of drought, the turtles suffered just as much as humans did. And they too would pray to Chuck for rain. The turtles are so cute. Don't scare them. Look, they're petrified. Oh my God. Near the palace, just up the hill a bit, is the Great Pyramid of Uxmal, as it's called. 
When found, it was still in a state of reconstruction. They were in the process of building a new temple on the top, but the project was never completed. This pyramid originally had nine levels, and if you go there, you are allowed to climb to the top. So, of course, that's what we did. The view up there is incredible. At the top is the Temple of the Guacamayas, which is named after the macaws decorating it. You can see our friend Chalk here at the entranceway, and three masks of Chalk appear on the corners of the building. Next to the Great Pyramid is the Temple of the Doves, or Dovecote, named for its tall crest that looks like a dovecoat. Keep in mind the building names, they're just names that modern people gave to them, they're not the original names. It is one of the earliest buildings of the town. The cresting is known to be of a specific type of Pu'uk style, which is dated to a single century, between 670 and 770 CE. It means the building was constructed then. Also at Ushmal is a ball court, the playing alley for the ubiquitous Mesoamerican ball game. You may be wondering about the game and how it was played. I'll tell you what I know in an episode coming soon. So make sure to subscribe if you don't want to miss it. But suffice it to say for now, this ball game goes back 3,500 years, making it the first organized game in the history of sports. This is the building that has come to be called the nunnery, a name the Spanish gave it, because the 74 small rooms that face the courtyard reminded them of a convent. It's not a nunnery, but a group of four palaces arranged in a quadrangle, built in the early 900s. Because they haven't discovered any domestic remains here, and there seems to be a, a hierarchy in the structures, we know that because of the different elevations of the buildings. The conclusion is that these were administrative buildings, where the ruling class must have had meetings to make their decisions, to collect tribute, to dictate sentences, things like that. Each facade has these beautiful designs connected to different gods. You can see masks of chalk, owls, two-headed serpents, symbols of the planet Venus, naked and tied human figures, both standing and sitting, with all kinds of geometric elements, lattice, columns, and so forth. The mosaics on the facade are interesting because they show the thatched roof homes of the ordinary people, which without images like this, we wouldn't know what they looked like. How did the Maya build these structures? Well, despite the lovely exteriors, the buildings were rather rough on the inside. They'd use a combination of rough stones, uh, dirt, cobbles in the core of the buildings. And then they'd put the finely shaped stone on the outside. In fact, you can see remnants of both the rough interiors and the fine exteriors quite well here at Ushmal. The most common stone used for the exterior was limestone, great for building and usefully workable. Did you know the Maya didn't have metal saws? Yeah, they quarried the limestone using a cord saw. And then after quarrying the limestone, they would use harder rocks like chert to shape and grind the surfaces into the desired form. The same way you work an arrowhead. You chip off tiny pieces over and over again, and then you polish it by grinding. Did it take a long time? You bet it did. These are extremely time intensive projects. Now the stones don't have clean cuts like you have in woodworking or some modern stone masonry, but the stone workers got very good at what they did and could form these stones with remarkable precision. The Maya would also cover most of their temples in lime plaster, which would be painted in various colors. But here in the Pulk region, they did that far less often. Instead, they preferred cut stone masonry to finish their buildings rather than the plaster. The relatively tight fit between slabs also helped to keep out the water and prevent erosion. But time and weather did take their toll on these buildings. Some people don't realize this, but a lot of the buildings that you will see at these sites have been reconstructed recently. They weren't found this way. If you want to go deeper and are looking for something to read on the Maya, the book The Ancient Maya by uh, Robert Scherer and Loa Traxler is a good primer. I'll link it for you in the description below the video. Next to the nunnery is the largest of all structures in Ushmal, 117 feet high, the Pyramid of the Magician or Sorcerer, also called the Pyramid of the Dwarf. These names are derived from local legend, which tells of a dwarf who was the son of a sorceress and 
apparently born from an egg. The dwarf made a wager with the governor of the city that if he could build a pyramid in one night, he could take his place as governor. Amazingly, he completed the job, which resulted in this structure, and he became the governor. So they say. It turns out that the pyramid actually was constructed in several stages. Did you know that the present name for this city, Ushmal, is derived from the word Oshmal, which means three times built, and it's a reference to this pyramid. But that's a misnomer too. Excavations here have revealed that there were in fact not three, but five stages of construction of this pyramid. The first stage was built in the 6th century, and the last in the 10th century. The older sections were covered over by the new ones. And so archaeologists had to dig their own entrances into the pyramid in order to access the earlier parts. They used the hieroglyphs to figure out the date for each construction period. I should mention that the pyramids built on this elliptical base, which for Mayan pyramids is unusual. But it looks cool, doesn't it? Inside the first, the original temple, they found this cool artifact. It's commonly called the Queen of Ushmal, but in fact, it's a young man. This is no longer at Ushmal, this is now at the National Museum of Anthropology in Mexico City. But his head is protruding out of the gaping jaws of a serpent, very stylized. We think he's a ruler, and he probably engaged in some kind of ritual in which he was symbolically swallowed by a boa, and then came back out of the mouth of the boa with the powers of a shaman. Ushmal is a fabulous archaeological site but we have plenty more to see and learn. In our next episode, we're going to visit the sites of Kaaba and Sayil, both of them within a few miles of Ushmal. At the site of Kaaba are some exquisite ruins you won't want to miss. We're able to identify one of the city's rulers by name, and I'll tell you something about him. If that sounds interesting to you, don't forget to subscribe and ring the little bell. That way you'll be notified when the episode's released. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.